Well, I'm Nathan. It's very nice to meet you. Hi. Thanks I'm for Wendy. Being here. <laughs> um, so tell me about yourself. What do you what do you do? I work at the Guanamos Center for Teaching and Learning at the University of Saskatchewan, and that's a, a group of people who help faculty learn to teach well. And how'd you get into that? I was a teacher for a number of years in the K-12 system and um, got really interested in how does teaching practice change over time. So I worked in a, a central office in a school division for a number of years, mm -hmm. uh, running a chunk of that, and then moved over into higher education. And so just noticing those changes over the years? What? Just kind of a real, I would say that I have a real interest in how do people learn to do something very well, mm -hmm. including how do you learn to teach very well and what causes teacher practice to change? I think there's a real difference between being an experienced teacher and an expert teacher. And the difference really interests me. So that's how I got into leading professional learning and helping people learn to do that well and try to determine, are you actually helping people or are you just spending time with them? <laughs> yeah. Just spending time with them? Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean by that? I think a lot of professional learning is more like training. We walk you step by step through something. Oh, I should have turned that off. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> we walk you step by step through something. <clears throat> and you learn the process of the thing, maybe, uh, although probably you remember about three to 10% of mm. what we've taught you. Um, really good professional learning is active. The participant is trying the thing that you hope that they're going to learn. They're reflecting on it. They're experimenting with what would it be like if they tried to put it into their practice so they can make good judgment calls about whether it's going to work for them or not. And they leave having already tried it. But it uh, took a number of years of learning and practice to really figure out what that looks like and how it works well. Um, so that's kind of why it became a passion is because so much teacher professional learning is not as good as it should be. Hmm. Yeah. Are you trying to improve any areas specifically, like any, um, any subjects specifically or just all, all over education? Yeah, all over education. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's... The nature of the work that I do in my professional work is always people will say to me, this is the thing I've been thinking about. How can I get better at that thing? Or we'll get a question from a number of people and then work on that. So for example, a question that we're getting right now is, ooh, there's generative AI like chat GPT. What does that mm. mean for my assessment? And then we would be uh, helping people figure out what that means and how to respond. Mm, yeah. That's got to be a tough question right now, especially the AI. Just... Um trying to look into the future right and see what's going to change and I, I imagine especially in your position looking at how can because a lot of your work is the tech, technology design around education as well correct yep technology assessment instructional approach all of those kinds of things um the generative ai kind of conversation is really interesting for me because it's showing up in in my uh, personal life, my big thing is coaching debate. Mm -hmm. And it's in all debate motions right now. And then in my professional life, it's um, helping people learn how to adjust their teaching practice um, to circumstances, to the way students change. And so in both places, it's making significant changes. I think in education, an interesting question is if technology does a good job of summarizing now, and that is what we used to call the way we check to see if people understood deeply. What's the way we check now? Yeah. And if it beca it's less important for humans to be able to summarize, machine learning does that super well. It just looks in an algorithmic pattern and says, look, this is the way this would commonly come up. So therefore, this is probably a good summary. Humans need to know a lot to do that well. Yeah. And so it's really interesting to think, okay, then what's a better test for the skills we need humans to have? Yeah, no doubt. I'm sorry. I completely forgot to offer you water or coffee I'm when good. we started. Thank Are you, you sure? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay, I'm going to pour myself a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been thinking about it a lot recently too because um, it uh, it's really interesting because I've got a buddy who said that his um, his younger son, or his younger son, his younger brother, is who is still in high school, has been writing papers with it. And so it's the issue is like, maybe he's still learning something, but he's definitely learning a lot less. So, yep. Yeah. Well, and papers are an interesting thing in and of themselves. I, I think most people use the skill of essay writing 
almost not at all mm-hmm. after they are no longer in school. Yeah. It's not really a transferable skill. We have you do it because it's a structure where we ask you to summarize and make judgment calls. Um, but you might summarize just as well in a format like a podcast. Mm-hmm. Much harder for Chat GPT to replicate at this point. Yeah. Much harder, but they're getting there. Have you seen? They some, will, like, and I've seen the art that they can do. Yeah, and yeah absolutely. It's fascinating. There's a lot of um, I've I've seen a lot of videos of people using AI to um, they'll make like fake podcasts between like Joe Rogan and yeah. Biden and and the presidents making fun of each other. But yeah, it's interesting. It's yeah, but um, yeah, it is harder to replicate. I my I was always curious about um whether because it will become so saturated the um the internet will become so saturated with ai content whether people will start to ignore it and prefer um actual human content and so things if people will continue to want to be educated by a person as opposed to a machine just because they know it's a person yeah i don't know i mean it's interesting when you see people trying to buy products that they now understand who made them under what circumstances Mm -hmm. that product is worth more in to some people than a mass-produced product of the same kind yeah will that be what happens yeah Yeah, i wonder because there's a big push for that in in the u.s i think right now is they're trying to bring a lot of manufacturing back inside inside the country and so yeah yeah it's interesting i think it's it's all tied in quite a bit does it it worry you the ai I tend to think of many of these things as just changes. Yeah. And so I think about um, when I'm helping teachers or debaters think about it, uh, what does this change mean? What's the underlying thing about it? Uh, what implications will it have? And because technology interests me, I've spent a lot of my lifetime kind of thinking about um, implications of various changes. And, to, and education doesn't adjust to change well. Mm-hmm. If you think about how much has changed in the way that you bank compared to how your parents banked, for example, or yeah. uh, f- fill a prescription, or I mean, virtually anything is very, very different. Uh, not so much education. It's a lot the same. And I think part of that is because um, we don't think as much as we should about what are the skills that people will actually need and how do we design ways of teaching and learning and assessing that match that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's going to be hard from um, this, the student side as well, just getting them to want to do that, I imagine. Because I, I even noticed when I was in high school, like I had lots of friends that would complain about like not learning about how to do your taxes or things like this, but there was a life transitions course and nobody that took nobody it. took. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So because that's not the course that people who are college bound take. When we embed that same thing, you know, calculating interest into a math that college bound people take, then they learn it. Like so, it's okay. it's an interesting. Yeah. There's societal structures built into that as well. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's really interesting. That was really eye opening. Yeah. Why do you think it's the education system is so resistant to change? Is it systematic or? I I think there's lots of reasons that it is. It's a, a publicly funded system that gets stuck in certain structures. I mean, you think about where do you see a fax system anymore? Almost nowhere, but your doctor's office has one because mm. the medical system built it in in such a way that that's how things move through mm. fax. <laughs> so there are, things get built into. Um, the way systems are are structured and then it's very hard for them to change. So we started doing uh, a lot of multiple choice type tests when we had a lot of um, students that we were trying to move through with large class sizes and it became possible for machines to mark those tests. And we knew when we were, you were filling out those little scan bubbles, you know, making sure your pencil marks exactly the right size. Yeah. So that standardized exam, we were thinking... That's how we'll be able to compare students to each other really well. And it will give us super useful information about the effectiveness of the school system. Well, as it turns out, it gives us really useful information about facts that students have recalled if we can ensure that the student can't get the fact from anywhere during the test. When you put all of that together in your head, you might wonder why would we spend so much time testing students Mm. (laughs) on facts? As an adult, when you want facts, uh, you don't think, what can I recall from grade 10 history? You just look it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, and I always thought going into an exam that it just, it, it made me feel like I was just practicing a three-hour recall. Yeah. That's, and that's all it was. I didn't feel like I was. 85% of tests are that. Yeah. Yeah. 
it, yeah, it didn't, it didn't really feel like a learning assessment. So. No, and we know actually that really good assessment actually teaches you as much as it tests you. Mm. And so um, if we really wanted to understand, for example, if you were good at podcasting, the most useful thing we could do is have you do a podcast. Mm. And the least useful thing we could do is ask you a fact-based test about this, this, or this microphone, or um, where, you know, white space is going to come from and how you can add it. Because it might be that you ask a- answer all of those questions correctly and are still a bad podcaster. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because there could be a big knowing-doing gap you yeah. could know and not be able to do. And so lots of the time, the assessment we design is just wrong. Hmm. Yeah, wrong for what we want to know. And from... Wrong, sorry, wrong from what you want to know? Yeah, so when a teacher decides to teach something, they need to think about an outcome or objective and say, well, this is the, this is the thing I'm trying to teach. And then they have to say to themselves, what will I accept as evidence that a student has learned that thing? Hmm. And so when you referred to those kind of three-hour fact dump things, if you ask the teacher, is my primary goal here that Nathan remembers a series of short facts related to the content of this course for about six months, then forgets them and never uses them again. No teacher would ever agree <laughs> that that's the goal. But or we admit de- to it. Right. Yeah. But that we design the assessment and the instruction as if it is. Hmm. Yeah. Do you think that's a result of just the sheer amount of students that need to be put through the system? Yeah, I think because our class sizes are large and because we've built other chunks of the system to look for that. So um, in high school, we say we have to give you those multiple choice tests because we're preparing you for university. And you go to, L sco- uh, go to school and university and they say, well, you know, you're going to have to do some standardized tests to get into this profession. So we're preparing you for that. Mm-hmm. Um, nobody thinks that they're actually preparing you to, to be a really good professional because you can recall those facts. Mm-hmm. But... But everybody says, well, that's a, it's a gateway. It's an intermediate we'd accept that's easy for us to mark and therefore what we do. Increasingly, professional colleges do a mix of here's this thing I'm checking and also we have you do this thing. So OSCEs and medicine are like that because we just understand that there's a, a mix of things we need to look for. An OSCE? Yeah. Um, various types of professional colleges have a test where you try to go and do that thing, usually with like a simulated patient or... Mm-hmm. So they're looking for things like, um, what's your bedside manner? Because that's a real problem for doctors. And we want to know, can you do this well? And if Mm -hmm. we ask you on a test, should you be polite to patients and get a full background history? Of course, we say yes, because we know it's the answer. (laughs) Does that mean we can do it? (laughs) Yeah. Does it ever seem like an insurmountable challenge trying to implement a more nuanced approach to assessment like that? When you've got so many, everybody's got slightly varied needs. Right, going through education. So there are things that are much better at handling varied needs and things that are much worse. So we were talking about uh, tests, for example. Now in education, many students would have accommodations for tests. They go to a separate space to write, for example, or they get twice as much time because there's a whole bunch of things that we've factually proven are problematic for diversity and access needs for students when we use this form of assessment. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we design instead assessment that we would say is more universal, and then we don't even need those accommodations. But the way in which we built the structure requires them often, which is really interesting. You ask like, why is it that way? It's a self-perpetuating cycle from that perspective. Yeah. Hmm. And so you're trying to break the (laughs) self-perpetuation? Yeah, I'm trying to get people to have the opportunity to think for themselves about what is it I'm trying to do here and what would I do if that, as opposed to um, this is what's always been done and so that's what I will do. Um, Mm. So lots of times if you can have a good conversation with a faculty member or even a K-12 teacher about um, when you teach this thing, what's the thing you would accept as evidence that a student could do it well, if you could have anything at all, They'll say, oh, it will be this. And then say, but I can't do that because I don't have time. And so if you can help them develop um, something that's like that, but is efficient, they will almost always do it. Mm. They just haven't thought of how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine there's not, I I imagine there's few teachers that don't want things to be more like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so or do teachers get more freedom now than to kind of come up with their own designs for assessment or is it still kind of 
a system that's spread out to everybody like it needs to be really depends yeah. um so some structures are very locked down and need to be a very particular way and sometimes there's a lot of academic freedom for how you do things it's it's varied across all all campuses in in canada sometimes determined by professional bodies mm. yeah you are uh, very knowledgeable in this area it seems like you've, you've you're very passionate about it <laughs> yeah uh, was did you always want to go into educational design and, and what nope. you're looking at now? No, uh, there's this point in university. I started out in education thinking, yep, yeah, that's my thing. And I had this point in university where I, I nearly ste- um, steered off that course and went kind of into law or something like that because mm. of the debate background and yeah. the coaching there. I think uh, education is a big thing for me because I had experiences in the education system which were both very positive and very negative and not a lot in the middle. Mm. And I think um, I noticed that among teachers. For some teachers, school was easy, they did well at it, and then they go and teach the thing that they did well. And for some teachers, they had problematic or bad experiences and decided to teach because they wanted to change things. And I'm probably in that second group. What were some of those positive experiences that you had? Um, I like learning. It took me a long time to learn to read. I'm dyslexic. But when I could read, having access to, to stories fascinated me. And I loved um, the opportunity to think about that with other students. I had, um, had very good teachers in high school in a number of my courses. And real opportunity to um, show my learning in any way that I could or um, get the opportunity to solve real world pro- problems that really interested me. Mm-hmm. I think it interests a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. I think so too. Yeah. I think that's one of the, the biggest things that you can use to get students engaged, anybody engaged. If you can show them how to apply something, it's quite a bit different than just like, you need to know this. Yep. You know, we were talking earlier about uh, cheating or, you know, just using AI as legitimate support. I think humans smartly use things that are efficient. And if a thing is disengaging, then they're just attempting to get it done as quickly as possible. (laughs) And if a thing is exciting, then they will voluntarily do it because they have intrinsic motivation well past what you want them to even, Mm -hmm. and maybe do it for a lifetime. Yeah. Yeah, you get something, you get get somebody something that they're really interested in, and they'll get obsessed and they'll keep doing it and doing it. Yeah, it's um. Is there anything that's like that for you? I was gonna say it's funny that you brought up reading because I remember going through up until honestly, I'm 22 now, and probably up until I was about 19 or 20, I hated reading. Right. I just thought it was, <laughs> it was dumb, and I was like, why would anybody do this? And yeah. um. And then I started finding books that I was interested in. And I don't, it was such a stupid thing to not think of, but I was like, oh my goodness, people write things that I want to read. Yeah. And once I realized that it was, I can't, I can't stop now. It's all I want to do. And so, yeah, just, I, I guess I'm in the same boat. I just love learning. That's why I do this. Yeah. I'm just trying to always garner more knowledge. And I just, I, I can't imagine not wanting to. Yeah. So. It just makes life so much more interesting, I find. Well, I'm a little older than you. I'm 50 (laughs) this year. (laughs) And I still feel that way all the time. Yeah. Well, I'm glad. I hope it won't slow down for myself. (laughs) It's it's, it's unfortunate because you just like, you want everybody else to be this passionate about it as well. Right? Like you you want everybody you come across to want to learn and want to become more educated and have this desire. And some people are just so checked out from it because they've had negative experiences in the education system or been forced to read books about things they don't care about for yeah, years exactly <laughs> yeah that's a big one especially because it's like if you're reading something you don't want to it just you i, I personally i just fall asleep i'll actually just fall asleep reading yeah. the book, so. yeah. what's your favorite book or well one? i don't know yeah. i don't have a favorite book i read almost everything my favorite author at the moment probably of like um just fiction stuff I like is a guy called Brandon Sanderson. Okay. Yeah, he writes um, science fiction and fantasy, mostly fantasy. Mm. Yeah, but I read almost anything. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And so you were, um, you said you you were in the K to twelve system for a while, and you mentioned a central office. Is that how you put it? Yeah. What, what were you doing there? <laughs> so uh, I was a high school teacher for a while, and then. Um, started teaching teachers how to use technology in the classroom. I got a a period of release and that was my job is to help teachers learn how to do that. 
And then a job became available um, at the Saskatoon Public Schools Board Office. Mm-hmm. And that is a place at the time where there was a set of people whose job was to go out and work with teachers in all kinds of circumstances. And they were they had an initiative going at the time, which was trying to modernize the way high schools did things. And so um, get rid of maybe some of those practices that we were trying to do as innovations in the 60s and just stayed even as research clearly indicated they were maybe not as good as we had hoped they would because schools are Mm self-reinforcing. So um, that job was focusing on student engagement and uh, assessment and dealing with cultural diversity more effectively, those kinds of issues. And so I was leading workshops for teachers and going out and working with teachers one-on-one. And then I started working, teaching leaders. So um, people whose job it was to lead groups of teachers. Um, And that's sort of what kept me focused on how do you build professional learning that actually changes practice. Mm. Yeah. That was a topic I wanted to ask you about, professional learning. Can you define that for me? Yeah. It means once you're already in a job, how do you keep improving over time other than what you figure out by yourself? And so school divisions, people will know, oh, the teachers go today, but the students don't. That's a professional learning day. Okay, okay, and the yeah, function yeah, yeah. of those days is to help teachers continue to have opportunities to learn and grow. And sometimes those are self-directed and sometimes there's a thing that a school division cares about or is working on and is trying to help people learn. Hmm. Yeah. So we're kind of like continuing education for doctors and yeah, the same continuing thing. education yeah. is exactly the same thing. Okay. Sometimes we call things educational development or professional development or professional learning, or continuing education. Those are all friends. Mm. They're the same thing. Is the is the engagement in on those like is PD PD days? Is that what yeah, sure. Yeah. Is, <laughs> um, is the engagement on during those good? Is it like a lot of the teachers looking to? It's exactly like a classroom is. Yeah. <laughs> So there are some people who are really excited to learn. There's some people who are only interested because it's this topic. And there's some people who are forced to be there. Mm. Yeah. How do you bring the, how do you bring the bottom up? The people that are forced. Well, I think you can be forced to be there for lots of reasons. Sometimes you're forced to sit in a PD session where you actually already know the information and have to be there just like a real classroom. (laughs) And sometimes you're frustrated and disinterested and, you just wish you were doing your marking instead because you know you're going home tonight to do some unpaid hours from that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the way you, c- you make it interesting is exactly what you said. You make it problems, you make it active, and you make it incredibly useful. People will en- engage in learning if they can see how it's going to help them. Even people who come into the session saying, this is a waste of my time. You just you need to help them engage with topics that fascinate them and in ways that make a difference. Do you have a um, an an example that stands out? It sounds like you've. I feel I've like you've a had a PD. Yeah. yeah, I feel like you've got a pretty a cool breakthrough story with somebody. Um, I think a really interesting conversation that I often have with people. We were talking about assessment earlier, so I'll go back to that. Um, might be, for example, if somebody is talking about why students struggle. Lots of times as teachers, we have a narrative that students fail because they want to. Mm. Nobody really wants to be a failure. (laughs) It's just like saying people go to jail because they want to be incarcerated. Like when you say that out loud, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, It might be that I have my effort or attention focused somewhere else. It might be that I think the class is stupid or I hate my teacher, but it's not actually true that I'm going into the class thinking I'm going to fail and that'll show you. (laughs) So... Often a really effective thing in PD is to start at beliefs and ask people what they think and and sort of why they think it. And if, for example, you've been coming into a situation thinking students just want to fail, then there's no reason to put any effort into those students. Mm -hmm. But if a teacher believes instead that a student thinks they can't succeed, there are many different things you'd do in your classroom if you had that belief instead. So often a thing I will do at a start of PD is I will put two different beliefs on a table and then have little pieces of paper that are a series of actions you could do as a teacher and say, line the actions up with these two belief systems. Guess what research would connect to which one? And so teachers will be talking about that with a buddy. They'll be lining them up and then there'll be this moment 
where they realize that the belief system that they have is over on the right hand side and the papers that they use are on the left and they have this moment of cognitive dissonance where they're like oh what i think and what i do are not the same and those are often the most effective pd because mm. nobody wants to be doing something that's not aligned with their own beliefs and values yeah, <laughs> yeah. we're going to cross purposes to the thing they want yeah i think it's almost impossible like <clears throat> excuse me i heard um one time an example of um like if you tried to convince somebody like um like al gore that climate change wasn't real yeah there would be no way to do it because that is his identity yep. you know that's exactly that's mm -hmm. his whole life has been built on that so there was there would be no way to convince him otherwise or somebody the opposite somebody that believes it's not yep. real if they built their whole life on it you couldn't convince them that climate change is happening so I think it's it's the same idea. This I, these people that it's really hard to get somebody to a, a point where it's like, I know you're doing your best and you're trying to help out, but these things don't align. Right. And unfortunately, you have to rework all of this work you've done. Yeah. It's kind of why you're going back to a fundamental belief that's underneath some other beliefs mm -hmm. because you, you, you can't change those fundamental beliefs, but no one, no one uh, wants to articulate to themselves on the surface you know, I believe it's hopeless and students can't succeed, but I spend all of my life every day working with students like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So underneath there somewhere, you do believe you make a difference or you wouldn't do that work. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's, it's about kind of going to that core belief that's under the surface belief, because exactly as you say, the core belief doesn't change. It's, yeah. it's there. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is do you think it, is this, easy once you can get them to that point or does it continue to be hard once once they've found that their core beliefs might need to change a little bit or that they the core they're... belief usually doesn't change it's the core practice aligned with those beliefs okay. so like you said the core belief holds but there's a surface belief that's kind of gone on top of that and then a series of things you're doing right. which are really problematic sometimes yeah. and so usually once the person has the cognitive dissonance and they start thinking about things they will attempt the new behavior and look to see what happens. It's one of the reasons you want to have them practice it in a PD setting so that they know how to do it well and won't try it badly the first time and then say, see, it doesn't work. Yeah. Because most of us try things not so well the first time. Yeah. So a little bit of practice before you have to do it in a real setting okay. really helps. And then you go try something and it gets a slightly different result and you say, huh, that student, student X that I thought was never going to try we did this thing and he tried and I, I've never seen him try all year. Huh? Maybe there's something there. Mm -hmm. And then they'll kind of try it again. And if it works even half of the time from a teaching perspective, something that works half the time, a win. <laughs> so those people will be like, okay, let's keep refining it. And then they will use yeah, it. Let's keep this rolling. Yeah. Do you find any self-sabotage? Maybe people that don't want to rework all these practices that they've Built so much time in and then yeah 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 because you've invested a ton of effort trying to do something and trying to learn to do it a different way is very time consuming and it's hard and teachers are busy they don't have spare time so saying hey stop doing it this way and start doing this other way they will defend why they do it the way they do it just as you would for anything that you do yeah, the way you want to yeah. do it <laughs> yeah yeah well um Oh, I lost my train of thought. It was, I can't remember. What... I had a, I had a follow-up <laughs> question for that. Um, it's coming back to me. I'm sorry. All good. Oh, um, once, uh, in, in these instances where these, uh, these professionals realize that they need to change these practices. Do you notice a lot? Like, I'm sure there's a lot of excitement when they get these students to start engaging more and they're like, Oh my gosh, this is working. And the student yeah. that they thought was a dropout or a loser or somebody that was trying to fail is now working really hard and getting it. That's gotta be, I imagine there's few things that are as exciting, <laughs> but I, I imagine that there's also this moment of, there could be a lot of moments of shame or remorse or guilt realizing that, they were butting heads with this student and it turned out that a lot of it was on them and they didn't want to put it there a lot of the times on sorry on the on the teacher yeah i understand it, what you're yeah. saying i think um we call it a teacher student relationship um and even now as i'm working with faculty and faculty have less opportunity to build relationship than a k-12 teacher might for example mm -hmm. um 
we call it a relationship for a reason. The student contributes some things and the teacher contributes some things. And I think you kind of have to approach it as a teacher as I knew better, so then I did better. Because if you spend a bunch of time in the guilt, then you're just wasting the effort and mental um, focus that you could on reaching more students on feeling badly about what you did. Mm -hmm. But I think it is important to acknowledge places where your teaching practice didn't accomplish what you wanted it to. That is a really big difference between expert and experienced teachers. Expert teachers, the research tells us, are checking all the time and asking, did this have the impact I wanted it to? Did students learn it well as I was teaching it? Mm -hmm. And so they're making those micro adjustments all the way along. And so they don't make errors for as long because they're always checking, 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 yeah. checking. Yeah. And so there's less need for the guilt too, because the, the error, <laughs> the error is smaller and the intervention is sooner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Could that be a difference too, between, um, teachers that maybe have a, a philosophy of I'm a teacher and I'm here to educate and help and instill what I believe I can do to help these students, as opposed to teachers who are like, this is my job. I have a curriculum. This is what I teach all day. I imagine there's a there's probably a big difference in the effectiveness between those two just uh, mentalities as well. Yeah, and I think if if people articulate their job as covering content related to a topic, and they sort of say students will or won't learn it, I don't influence that. I just transmit the topic. To me, that teacher is not a lot different than a website or a textbook. Also transmission subtopics mm. <laughs> and so you might ask you know you in a youtube video <laughs> like <laughs> what's the distinction yeah and i think the distinction where a professional teacher belongs is in the extra things that you do that are beyond the transmission but that's another one of those things um schools got built this is uh going back in time schools got built to teach us literacy skills because a major way that things happened is we find information through books when we mostly didn't need to read we didn't need to educate the population the same way people would just became apprentices and learned trade or the, you know a small portion of us once we built big factories of learning which schools are and we sorted people by you know expiry date you were born in this year <laughs> grouped with all the other people like you we yeah. move you along um all of that was about the idea that there's a set pool of information that you will acquire in the correct order and then it will be in your brain and then you're prepared for anything. You get a check mark going. Yeah, yeah. that was before we had these lovely little computers we call mm-hmm. cell phones. You know, so we need a set of skills, we need some attitudes, but a lot of the stuff that was previously layers of facts for recall much less significant than it used to be Mm. schools are still built as if it's pretty darn important it's a hard problem (laughs) yeah i mean yeah (laughs) wow i what do you think about the the phrase um you should be teaching student how does it go it's like the idea that um teachers should be teaching how to think but not what what to think yeah. How to learn, what not to learn. I, I yeah. really think that one. Yeah. And I think um, the more technology changes, the more important it's going to be able to, it's going to be to do things like look at something and try to determine if it's true. That skill is going to be really important. Yeah. You were talking earlier about how um, a bunch of stuff might be machine generated and the veracity of that information. Who knows? Some will be correct and some will not be. Machines are not vested in that yeah, yeah. They're neutral on that subject. Yeah. So I think uh, understanding how to learn over a lifetime has become so much more important than it used to be. Um, I mean, we talk about your generation having so many different jobs over time. And uh, my parents' generation did not. They trained for one thing and they did that thing. Mm-hmm. And so just within the space of two generations, what we want humans to do is very, very different in, in societies where there's a good chunk of money in technological advancement. Right. Yeah. 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 Two generations is not a lot. It's It's really not. It's it's actually nothing. (laughs) Yeah. You find there's a lot of people at the, at the top kind of in, in that the most 
and I guess the the oldest generation of education that's still around that are trying to um, hold on to it and just don't want it to be different just for not really a good reason? Or I, th- I think that we train to do something as teachers. Hmm. I mean, we were taught um, to be good transmitters of information and our models were good transmitters of information and we got into the posi- into teaching for a love of students and often a love of the discipline, right? And so, you know, that's why I'm a physics teacher instead of an English teacher or whatever, because I love physics and I want to think like that. And as times are changing and more and more, we need to be thinking about how do we prepare students to think and uh, have them wrestle with the big and interesting problems of our society those are harder things to teach a lot harder to teach than covering the basics of physics and the amount of diversity in a classroom is higher and the sheer number of students in a classroom is higher so the job's a lot harder than it was even when i started and um that's complex and i think some teachers really grieve the simplicity of teaching a bunch of students who were expected to do what you said or removed from the classroom and just testing them at the end on what they remembered about the good things you said. (laughs) It's a much simpler world. (laughs) What was your favorite subject? Like disciplinarily, what interests you? Um, I actually don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Do you know what doesn't? Probably not English given that you didn't love reading. Yeah. Yeah. No, I wasn't. I was actually I was talking about that the other day. I didn't I didn't like English, but it was because I didn't really know why I needed it. Right. So, um, I wish I would have enjoyed it more. But I yeah I don't know I. Well, and this is you're doing English right now. Yeah. Like you you are using your speaking skills and interviewing people about their stories. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly it's ironic because I never yeah I never thought it was like my least favorite thing to do. But you know like in English I was I was talking to somebody about this this week is that. I wish I paid attention more and enjoyed it more because I, I I knew that like we'd get a book and we had to do a book report or read it and then we would have to talk about like why was the author saying this? What were they really saying? What are the symbols they were using here? But right. I don't know why I didn't connect it, but I didn't realize that the idea was to be able to build your comprehension skills. Right. I, it was never really established to me. Like nobody ever, they were just like, okay, we're going to read this and look at it. And... Now I understand that all of that writing and all of that reading was so that I could go out into the world and if somebody gave me a complicated topic, I could look at it and actually be able to break it down. And ruck- luckily, I did actually retain those skills, but I would have had a lot more fun if I would have known that that was what I was trying to do, you know. Yeah, yeah. and I think when we're teaching modern English, you shouldn't just be doing that with novels and poems, right? Mm-hmm. You you really should be doing that with YouTube videos and yeah. doing that with... Um, position papers released by politicians and if you think about all the ways that the world tries to manipulate your thinking right now English is a really important class if it really if students really understood that that's what they were doing Mm -hmm. like they were learning how to figure out what's underneath things and know what's true yeah yeah that's really interesting I love it and (laughs) I just I I love it too my favorite place to um like really think about it and do it is movies I love I love a movie that um just is they're like just behind the line of the line of being too explicit to be boring right <laughs> and they're just beyond being too symbolic to be completely understandable right or, or ununderstandable. so there's yeah. stuff to figure out but it's not like really ridiculous yeah, yeah. exactly because it's so much fun because you get little things like um have you ever watched the peaky blinders yeah um have you watched the last season no sorry know? yeah okay i don't there's not really a spoiler but um there's a the in the the first episode of the last season, there's a bar and somebody goes in there and it's all fine. And the dove flies in. There's a dove sitting on the window. Yeah. And everything's fine. And there's a little bit of an altercation, but nothing really goes sideways. And then on the way out, it's after like this this rough scene and things have gone sideways. And um, this, the guy that walked into the bar on his way out shoots the dove. And so it was just, I, I loved that because it was this idea that the dove is sitting there showing that right now everything's okay. Yeah. And then he walks out and shoots the dove and it's just this destruction of peace, yeah. which is what the, the, dove the dove represents. Is. Yeah. And then the rest of the season is chaos. Yeah. And so, um, which is what sets it up for that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm fascinated by that and that, yeah. that comprehension. And so, yeah, so yeah, I just, I really wish I would have liked English more in high school because I think I would have, <laughs> I would have just enjoyed those little details like that. But I think I found the answer to your question to what I liked the most was um, probably psych. 
Oh, okay. Which is then that's what I um I just finished my bachelor's of arts in psych, and um, so I wish why we do what we do interests you. Yeah, and just yeah, yeah exactly why people think, mm. um, why people think the way they do, um, why they say the things they say, why they're motivated the way they are, and um, I just recently I've just been fascinated by people that um, uh, are hypocritical. I find a lot of people like will say things and not even necessarily rude, but they'll just like make comments about the world and about people. Yeah. And then I'll hear them or, or see them express those same things they were complaining about in themselves, but they just, they don't, aren't they really don't make the connection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's really interesting. I just, I'm, I'm fascinated by the, the, the mind and the way people are. Yeah. Just the mind in general, I guess. I think we have that in common actually. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm hearing you talk about it. Yeah. I, I was telling you early on that I almost went off in a debate direction. Yeah. The reason that interests me is it comes back to your Al Gore thing. It's about persuading people. What What is it that people believe and decide and why? And what will they find convincing in shifting their topic? And debate topics are always topics where there are half of society is in one direction and half of society is in another. Mm -hmm. And then you're thinking about what's the compelling way? How are people judging this topic? How do they make decisions? So that fascinates me. I don't, I don't get to teach anymore except in higher education, obviously, but I still work with high school students on debate mm -hmm. and they even come to the university and work with me there. And that's the thing I love is teaching them to figure out what will motivate people and how can we construct things that persuade them? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. That is that's something that I wish I would have I would have tried out in high school as well. Cause we had like a, a mini debate thing in, in grade eight, right? But I never took it any further. And yeah, but it's it's fascinating because like when you're debating, you're doing like you're really doing mental or psychological martial arts. You are you're wrestling. And you're trying to find it, and all of a sudden there's this opening, and you can get in there. And the best part about it is when you have um, an opponent or somebody that you're debating in real life or in a formal setting that um, is very respectful and has good sportsmanship and can go, wow, like I never, you actually, I, you found a hole in my argument and yeah. I'm, and I'm, I thank you for that. You know, that's the big, that's the big part. Cause I love when that happens to myself. Oh, me too. When I'm yeah. speaking to someone and they make me stop and go, like, you got uh -huh. me. Like, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. There's yeah. nothing like that. <laughs> and so in, in debate then, so uh, do you, are you like a debate instructor? Or are you on the teams or how does that? Okay. Well, this is, it goes back to, so uh, I started debating when I was in high school and I just was good at it. So yeah. it's kind of one of those things where whatever you start doing and then you're good at naturally, then you get more opportunities in that thing. Mm -hmm. So I wound up um, competing at the world's level in high school. Oh, wow. I did not know there was a world's level. To there is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And Canada is a very strong debate country. Wow. So uh, doing well in Canada is exciting and doing well at the world's level, more exciting. So I got doing that. And then because I was learning to teach everything, I was like, okay, well then I'm, I'm going to coach debate. So that's mm -hmm. from when I was 19 on, like I was still debating in the university circuit, but I was coach coaching debate is my thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, both like locally in Saskatchewan and then students who are going to, going to go to worlds for Canada those are the kids that I coach. Yeah. Wow. And so what, what is the, what is the structure of a debate of a formal debate? Um, sometimes there are two teams on a side, sometimes four, depending on the style of debate. And you get okay. something that's called a motion or a resolution or a topic. That's like, here's the thing we're going to debate when it's debate tournaments. You don't get to pick the side you agree with. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so you just get given a motion most debate now is what's called impromptu, which just means you don't know what the topic will be ahead of time. Oh, wow. So you can't prep it. No. Wow. I, <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. So um, there can be cultural topics like, you know, this house regrets the narrative that your work should satisfy you. And hmm. then you're just having a debate about what's the nature of work as we understand it and where should you get your happiness from? Does happiness matter? Does productivity matter more? And that's the, con it's like philosophical. And sometimes it's very practical. Like you might ask, you know, should people who are mature at 17 have the same right um, to choose uh, to die that a sick person who is 19 has with mm -hmm. the doctor assisted approach? You might have that debate, like do seven, are 17 year olds capable of the kind of thinking that a 19 year old is? 
So it could be anything in between that, you know, what should we do with Ukraine right now? Yeah. yeah. So that's the kind of thing. And depending on the style of debate, you have a chunk of time to prepare somewhere from 20 minutes to an hour. Hmm. And you and your partners are alone in the room, no devices. And it's just, what do you know? about this wow. so this is specifically for impromptu still is for impromptu. 20 minutes to an hour okay. yeah yeah in a prepared motion usually you get a motion a couple of weeks before a tournament okay. yeah. but it's rare now that a tournament would only have a prepared motion in it hmm. so i'm preparing my students for a tournament that'll have usually seven or nine rounds of debate and maybe two or three of those might be unprepared topics most of the rest are not hmm. is it just was everybody just getting too good at preparing for why they start getting rid of the <laughs> well when i was a high school debater there were no videos that you found online of people previously debating right this okay. motion. yeah yeah yeah, that yeah. Makes sense. yeah. <laughs> and it's a it's much harder to your point to kind of be making it up as you're going along and needing to just know lots of things and thinking about well what are the common ways this is structured so it's it's the sport is harder than it used to be yeah yeah so you you go and you prep with your partner and you just basically take turns going back and forth between the two sides, saying points for your side and responding to the points that the other side has said. Mm. And then somewhere near the end, there's usually a speech where you're just telling your judges, we should win and here's why. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, that's I never thought about it being... The impromptu part fascinates me, especially because I find that even when I'm just having a, a tough discussion with a friend or a family member that... I'm like, I am actually figuring it out as I'm going, you know, sometimes you're, yeah. again, bringing it back to martial arts. Sometimes you might go for a move or something and you're like, I'm not as good at this as I thought I was. Like, I probably shouldn't be taking this angle. Yeah. Or like, oh, I'm better at this. And so yeah. I, I imagine that happens a lot where you're debating and you're like. Stuff's coming out of your mouth and yeah. you're thinking, uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, and other debaters can ask you questions too. So mm. sometimes you're saying something. And the other debater will see that you've overextended yourself. And then they're up and they're like, on that point. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's going to be so much fun to coach. It's right. amazingly fun to coach. Yeah. yeah. Unlike when I've coached basketball or something like that, I can't intervene in any way mm -hmm. while the round is on. So everything is about my teams. And I can't help them in impromptu prep. Everything's about teaching them how oh. to think, how to the how to fish, how to think thing that you asked mm -hmm. earlier. Um, so that when they hit that motion, they're good. Yeah. Wow. And um, is there any, like, is, is there a technique to debate that, like, you teach and are, like, regularly teach? Or is it completely individual in style? Or No, there's a lot of technique yeah. to it. So um, you teach debaters to understand patterns in the way arguments are built, but also the way in which an argument that you make about personal autonomy in this topic would probably also apply in these other topics. So that debaters at least have a little bit of a pattern, a set of moves mm -hmm. <laughs> that they can use. <laughs> so it's not brand new yeah. every time. And debate has its own vocabulary and all those kinds of things. Yeah. What would be an example of specific debate vocabulary? Um, so a thing we think about in debate sometimes is something like unique harms. That's a phrase debaters would use. And they okay. would basically say... Um, the side that's in favor of the motion is usually proposing some kind of change. And so they'll say, okay, well, here's the change we should make. And this is the difference that it's going to make. And then usually the side opposing will say, yeah, but if you do that, all these bad things will happen. A <laughs> very common pattern in debate. Mm -hmm. So then the proposition might get up and say, well, those bad things that you described, they're not unique to our solution. They actually happen um, in lots of situations. And so don't attribute that to us as a reason not to do this thing. It's not a unique harm. So that's an idea that you play with a lot in debate is what causes what. So if you have a motion on global warming and you're proposing a particular solution, then um, the other side might say, well, uh, this will cause these kinds of economic problems. And the, the side that agrees with the most will say, yeah, any, any possible solution to global warming needs us to consume less. Yeah. Yeah. Except possibly some kind of a technical solution we don't currently have the technology for. Yeah. So mm. those kinds of things, thinking about what causes what, why is it this way, debates a lot about that. Mm. One of the examples you gave earlier was um, like about deriving satisfaction from work. Yeah. That's a more of a, like a, a philosophical topic. How yes. does, is scoring difficult for, for <laughs> debate? I imagine that would be a hard topic to kind of, because not only is like, I imagine on top of just the obvious ability of the debaters, there's also the strength of just the 
the um, the topic itself and how right. malleable it is. So. Yeah, so topics are usually picked so that both sides are equally hard. If the motion is good, that's what happens. Hmm. And so when it's being scored, there's typically about five categories. So one thing is how strong are your arguments? Another question is how well do you argue with the other side? How well do you speak is important because it's debate. <laughs> yeah, you're talking. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then there's a, a set around strategy often where it's really trying to understand, did you pick the smarter argument, which was likely to have less problems in it? Did you anticipate how important this argument and this argument might be relative to each other and say that to the judge? Um, so there's a, a whole set of things around your strategy for how you do things. And then often there are some things that are specific to this particular style of debate. So just like there are different martial arts, there are different types of debate. And so there are skills specific to this style often mm. that people are looking for. Is it, um, do you find that teams, or I guess your team often finds the outcome to be fair? Or is there a lot of times where it's kind of like, eh, I would have. Yeah, there are lots of, there are lots of ways in which a judge might be influenced. And so sometimes debaters will say, oh, we should have won that round. And I will usually say, yeah, I think he did win that round, but the judge didn't. So you could have done more. That's the way it <laughs> you is. Gotta, yeah. you gotta, it's a persuasive art. <laughs> yeah. You gotta persuade. Yeah. So. Uh, a lot of what we're doing is trying to figure out, um, we'll watch you as we're, if you're our judge while we're debating and see, oh, did we get a smile from Nathan mm -hmm. there? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've got something. Yeah. Is Nathan writing down what we just said? Yeah. Okay, that was persuasive to him. And maybe Nathan and Wendy are sitting side by side, and so we need to persuade a 20-something man and a 50-year-old woman, <laughs> both of whom are from, you know, one's from Nigeria and one's oh, yeah, I guess from I think Hong that. Kong and... <laughs> So wow. you need arguments that transcend culture and transcend age, and that's challenging. Yeah, I imagine, especially especially on on top of just the the demographic piece, but the cultural icon. I imagine would be some cultures have ideas that are completely wildly different for essentially arbitrary reasons, but they're as true to that culture as it is untrue to the next. That's why debate is such a good activity right now because mm. we are so polarized and becoming more polarized in our thinking. Yeah. And debate has, try on the ideas of others, but also question the underlying assumptions. So many of my students will start with a concept like murder is wrong. And they'll say, well, of course murder is wrong. And I will start asking questions. So is it wrong when a soldier kills another one because they've pre-planned that? And then students are like, okay, well, it's not wrong in war. I'm like, well, what if the soldier kills a civilian? Oh, no, that's murder. <laughs> what if they didn't mean to? Oh, intent matters. You know, and yeah. then you start talking about, well, what if you are killing to protect someone else? What if someone wants you to kill them and has asked you to? And all of these kinds of things cause us to really refine our thinking about a concept that initially students would say is very black and white. And then once you get cultural aspects in, in Western societies, often we think it's really important for an individual to get to choose. That's a very fundamental Western belief. And in fact, we, we believe it so much, we let you make really stupid choices <laughs> just so you're allowed to pick. And in many other places in the world, it's more important that the whole of society is successful or that the individual is doing things to protect and uphold the family. So fundamental differences at the heart of how people think about things make really interesting ways to approach debate because your judges could be from either perspective yeah yeah yes it's yeah it's it's very very interesting especially because um like cultures that are considered to be uh quite intellectual and i've thought a lot of just their policies and um government and societal structures through a lot Yep. can be very are, are are varied like that like there's a they think are. about the the east and um it's much more communal and um uh collectivist yeah and over here it's very very individualistic yeah but both are have incredible societies yeah and That's and right. both have advantages and disadvantages like under certain circumstances one of those is very helpful and in the other situation not so much yeah. right yeah yeah, it's yeah, it's really really interesting, and well, so do you do you only coach 
now or do you ever get to i get to debate sometimes but not very often there's um there are opportunities occasionally where there'll be some kind of an activity that i get to do debate in and i often demonstrate things for my students obviously um but there aren't many debate tournaments for the older folk in fact debate would refer to them as debate dinos It means people who are still debating, although we think they should be extinct. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, it is. Everybody else wants you guys to <laughs> chill out. It is what it is. It's um, Debate's really interesting, too, because it changes. So the way people make compelling arguments as influencers changes the way debate is. You know, mm. like all whatever is happening in the media that's influencing how people construct an argument for something gets absorbed by debate which is why it's really interesting because it's constantly changing as society changes yeah yeah i bet that's that is that's probably an easy area to pick on on are they is it an opponent is that what you call the person yeah you would say my opponent yeah um but yeah (laughs) yeah well good question (laughs) yeah yeah but I i feel like that would be um a good area to pick on your opponent is if you can tell that they're just regurgitating stuff they're hearing in social media and from influencers and yep so. and lots of times when you do that there you're missing the thing that underlies what you're saying mm-hmm. and then as a result um it's easy to go after you because you don't know what your own underlying assumptions are yeah yeah <laughs> yeah well it's so easy i've caught myself doing this so many times it's so so easy to repeat things and then realize you don't know what you're talking about yeah especially just with like simple words like i'll say something sometimes and my friends will be like what does that word mean yeah i've and then i'll realize that i know where to put the word but i actually don't know the definition of it right what yeah. what is its root what is its yeah. intention yeah yeah um wow do you ever watch the political debates i do yeah, yeah. does it frustrate you very much <laughs> and most canadians i think yeah. <laughs> I think um, had I gone the law direction, one of the things that debaters often do when they go that, that direction, their job is to teach politicians how to appear to say something while saying nothing. Yeah. And that's yeah. just so hard to morally feel good about yourself. That's what you do yeah. for a living. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting. I don't, I don't I've, I've never watched them. I've, I've seen clips, but yeah. every now and then I'll see clips just, and not even from like a formal debate, but just like from the House of Commons. I'd be like, what are you guys saying? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yep. It's interesting. You know, I think a lot of people imagine that debate as a sport is like debate in the House of Commons, that people are mad and putting on a show. And, you know, it's it's your martial art analogy is much closer. Mm. You know, like when you're in the ring, you're trying to win. And then as soon as you are done, that is over. It's, yeah. You're not actually angry at the other. I mean, sometimes you become angry, but you don't. That's not the goal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's it's interesting, too, because I imagine in debate, especially in less formal debate, there's also, like, to, to tie in another martial arts analogy, like in wrestling, you can get, um, I think it's one point if you just push your opponent out of the mat, as long as it looks like you're trying to do something. So you yeah. can just keep doing that until you get enough points, but you're not really, like, <laughs> you're not demonstrating a more intricate skill or, like, a right. knowledge of the sport. You're just brute forcing your way through this match. I It seems to be that that's happening a lot in the social media space, politics space. And particularly, I think the <laughs> the coupling for the pushing the opponent out of the mat would be just getting louder in terms of the debate yep. aspect. Well, and also not proposing anything, just opposing who that person is mm. as opposed to saying, what are you actually in favor of? Yeah. So then we're like, well, Justin Trudeau is bad. Pierre Polyev is bad. I'm like, yeah, what is the actual policy of theirs that you want to talk about? <laughs> yeah. Who knows? They're just bad. <laughs> Yeah. yeah and it's, it's frustrating when you hear that too because then you're like because again that question what is bad like you're not you're not saying anything like tell me what's what's actually up yep. here you know yeah um i heard one time too that recently that um people that um make negative points appear smarter and um i think that's it, it seems to be true at least when i notice it it seems that when somebody comes out and they've got this apocalyptic thinking or they think that especially when they apply apocalyptic thinking to a person and they're like no they're going to bring about doom and chaos and all these things it seems like they know something because they're making negative predictions yeah. which is really interesting because you take somebody that could be doing that opt like could be doing the opposite and being optimistic with the same intensity they just don't seem like they know as much for yeah. some reason no. they could both be equally wrong or right 
But when I'm teaching debate, it's actually I spend way more time trying to teach people to build a good argument than I need to spend teaching them to tear an argument down. Because it's just much easier to criticize than yeah. it is to actually suggest something useful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And explain it well. Yeah. So I wonder why that is. I wonder why the brain is uh, favors that. Yeah, yeah, I think one of the things we know about learning is that the way the human brain learns things is it makes a generalization and then it kind of tests that generalization and refines it. Right. And mm. so it's always looking for what's wrong here. So I think humans just naturally think about that really yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes perfect sense, especially if you think about just survival. And if you can, the things you can get rid of, it's, it's easier to get rid of things than it is to gain things. So yeah. if you can figure out how to come down on the things that you don't want around, probably easier than putting in the work to build something new up. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very true. I think... It, that's why so many of the things that I'm interested in are similar. It's because that issue of why do we think what we think and how can we be persuaded to change our, our thinking or behavior over time interests me so much. And mm -hmm. because it's exactly what you said, so hard, so hard to do that well. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be, it's going to be so, so rewarding though, especially in your line of work when you're, because you're in an interesting area where you're teaching teachers who are also teaching other teachers in a lot of yes. instances. So it, you've got a, a um, very meta. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that it's amazing because you, you're in this position where if you can make these breakthroughs, there's such a chain of possibilities that are possible from that. And yeah. Very I, motivating. <laughs> yeah. I imagine. Yeah. Wow. Uh, there was a question I wanted to ask you. Were, you said that um, you had good experiences and bad experiences in education growing up and not a whole lot in between. And you yeah. said that you think that it's probably the negative ones that have pushed you to the position you're in. Yeah. Is there anything in particular that you wanted to fix or like the moment that you're like, this needs to be better, that kind of, that you think spurred you down this path towards hmm. where you are? I got all the way to grade five without being able to read hmm. and my teachers didn't really know. <laughs> so that's a lot of years. And in those years you go from learning to read to reading to learn. Like you're no longer trying to figure out how to read. You're supposed to be getting information from reading. Right. Yeah. Reading comprehension. <laughs> as You said earlier. Yes. So I got all the way out of that first zone and into the second zone without anybody really understanding that mm. or knowing how hard it would be every day to be in school, not understanding anything and having to just be in that situation constantly. So I think that was the biggest thing that motivated me is that I think there, I think it's possible to reach any child. I think teachers just need a wide skill set and some actual resources. Sometimes we put teachers in untenable positions where it's impossible because they have too many complications and no time. But given those things, I think it is possible. And that's the big, that's the big motivation for me. And I think about all the conversations, for example, that you are having now because your brain got interested in something. And then what will those conversations spawn? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> So the, I think there's a lot of opportunity in every person if we can find where they, where they need us to help. And so that's what, that's what motivates me. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's beautiful. Did it frustrate you that nobody had caught on for so many years? To... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Especially because now I understand why they should have been able to tell right away. And I, I, I'm a frustrating combination. It's hard for teachers to tell. I, I couldn't read, but I was very good as many dyslexics are at saying things persuasively and, and, um, memorizing information. Hmm. And at that time, because school was so like, you all go through the same reader and you start at the same part in the reader every day, I would just like take it home, get my dad to read it to me and memorize it and then come back and pretend to read it. Hmm. And then when I was writing, I would have lots of the classic dyslexic problems. My B's and D's would be backwards or that, that kind of thing. So there, there were places where there were obvious clues like that and places where things were hidden, like I appeared to read and just miss some words sometimes. Yeah. That's hard. Hard for a teacher to figure yeah, out what's going yeah. on there. Yeah. Yeah. 
Did your dad only just read it to you and let you memorize it? Did he know that you were dyslexic or? Yeah, his brother is dyslexic okay. actually. So he, how his brother eventually learned to read is my dad just kept reading to him as his younger brother, mm. right? And so I think my dad was thinking, well, eventually this will work out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and he had four kids and there was a lot going on, yeah, you know, of but so he was thinking, well, this will, this will probably work. Mm. And my parents didn't know how to advocate well in the school system and, you know, kind of all the classic stuff. So it seemed like the, the most legitimate and useful solution that in the moment. That you think of yeah. and had the energy to do. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, school systems don't handle exceptionalities on the two ends very well. Mm. And I was fast at things and also was not reading. And those two things... I was strange combination of totally overwhelmed and bored. Well, <laughs> it seems like it should be mutually exclusive. Yeah. 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 I wasn't an easy student. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I, do you mind if I ask you more about dyslexia? No, not at all. I, I have a very superficial knowledge of it. I understand that it just makes things harder. But what, like, so when you say your, your D's and B's are backwards, is it actually that you're seeing them in the wrong orientation or is it just that they just come onto the paper that way or yeah they come out that way and if i misspelled a word by forgetting the s off the end for example which is something i do pretty regularly if Mm. it needs to be a plural or singular and i was to reread it my brain would just insert the s Mm. like i i would not realize necessarily that it's not on the paper but for example um you have a paper in front of me right now and i can read it upside down no problem oh really (laughs) yeah have you read it do you know what i wrote down (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I wasn't trying to, but I absolutely <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. can. That's funny. So, wow. you know, that's an interesting superpower. So yeah. see, <laughs> dyslexia. I once went to the science center with my husband and we were looking at a display with like mirror writing and missing letters. And I was like, this display is dumb. I don't understand what it's trying to say. And Mike's like, it's mirror writing. And I could not tell. Wow. Yeah. And once he said, like, and he's like, this part... If I really concentrate, I could see it. But otherwise, my brain just fills in gaps. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. So it's because that happens to a lot of people, but obviously not in, in as as much of a problematic way. Yeah. So it almost seems like just like a runaway train a little bit. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And I learned at the stage where a lot of people learn to read. I learned to read. If, um, when you get to about that grade five level, there's a different part of your brain that you can start to use as dyslexics and you use that to read instead. Okay. And so, um, and we wouldn't always use the word dyslexic now. That's the word that was used when I was diagnosed and so I use it. Um, but there are various reading disabilities that have different things associated with them and lots of time over time the brain can learn to compensate. Mm. Yeah. it's interesting. I am... Um... I don't have that, but I, I work with numbers quite a bit at, at work. And sometimes if I'm putting in an account number, that's got like a bunch of, it'll have like four zeros in it. Right. At some Like I figured out, it's, but it's sometimes for a moment, it, I can't tell if there's three or four. Is it kind of like yeah, that? That's yeah, that's a really lovely analogy. It's okay. a lot like that. Wow. <laughs> in fact, it's really hard for me that lots of things now need multiple multi-factor authentication with multiple numbers. Right. Because if I need to be able to know that this is a six and a nine or a three and an eight, I get those wrong a lot. Mm. And so sometimes I'm three times into a multi-factor authentication before it's correct. (laughs) You get locked out a lot? I do. Yeah. Yeah. And if I have to enter my, um, you know, credit card information, I've got lots of elaborate structures with, um, you know, multi-factor authentication built into my phone so I don't have to do it manually because it's very hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any like phonetic tricks that you can use, like speaking or like just like... No, not really. (laughs) And that's a really hard thing because when people are teaching you to read and they see you're a bad speller, which dyslexics are, they'll often say, well, just slow down and look at it again. Thinking Mm. that, as you said, I slowed down and then I could see that it was four zeros or three zeros. Not super helpful. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) No. Weird. I can concentrate a lot and that can help some, but it doesn't actually solve the problem. I'm still stuck on the upside down right reading thing. That's just, <laughs> and so you, did you ever practice it or did it just? No, because <laughs> my brain is just, so a friend at work has a broken keyboard and it doesn't type ends right now. Okay. I'm like, just plug in an external, but she hasn't done that yet. She's yeah. just frustrated with the ends. Anyway, yeah. 
So she sent this email with all the ends missing. And <laughs> at three or four of those in, she sent an apology saying the N isn't working. Yeah. I had no idea. You just filled it in. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and wow. another person who's in the same email chain is like, I think I've responded to what you were asking here, but I don't think I understood what you wrote well enough yeah. that I'm sure I did. Wow. Yeah. And for me, not, not an issue. So do you struggle with words that are correct more than words that are incorrect like in that case the ends were missing you didn't struggle with i don't read individual words i read groups of words together okay yeah so i read very quickly at this point now mm -hmm. and i will read often like a, a phrase or a sentence at a time so i'm just not seeing the pieces that are missing because my brain is saying often this this and this means this it probably does here because it can't tell it's predicting it's making mm. good guesses. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you just have a heuristic system, essentially. That's. Yep. That's right. Yeah. Wow. That's so interesting. Do you ever? <laughs> just... Is this your strangest interview so far on the podcast? <laughs> it's, I'm this one of the most fascinating things. Of... Why well, just? I've, I've, I, I don't know. I, just, I had a friend one time that um, was as well, and they just I never asked him about it. So. It's... Yeah. Do you ever practice reading upside down? Just because. <laughs> No, because I just do, right? It's not, yeah. it's, yeah, I don't. I just, but sometimes I'm in situations where I'm in a negotiation or something with somebody or when I go into an interview, for example, mm -hmm. people will have their page in front of them <laughs> really and accepted. I can see this question and I can also see the next question yeah. and I'm a debater so I can be talking in this question while I'm thinking about the next question. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. That's an interesting skill. Is Was that hard to develop? Yeah. Being able, yeah. Yeah. Lots of practice. Yeah. Yeah. I can't. It's something I it, it really, I, um, it's difficult doing this because, um, obviously my goal is to be a hundred percent in the conversation right. and I'm listening and then, but I also sometimes have to anticipate whether I want to try and find a question in what my guest is saying, or if I want to move on to one that I've right. got pre-planned, but I cannot, <laughs> I can't hold on to it. And I find sometimes that um, I'll be speaking, or I'm sorry, my guests will be speaking, and they'll have something, and I'll be like, oh, there's a question there that's really interesting. And then I'm holding on and holding on, and I'm like, nah, I have to let go, because I realize I'm not listening anymore. Right, you're just so, trying to hold that piece of information. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. how long did it take you to get that down, you think? Um, I, started, I started debating in, I did one debate in grade 9, so really mm -hmm. grade 10, and by the time I was on the world's team in grade 11, I could do it. But wow. you practice a lot. Yeah. yeah. So you're just constantly listening to somebody talk. You're trying to get details down. You're trying to think about what will you say in response. And so you have only, you can't write very much and do all of those things at once. Yeah. <laughs> so you'll look at a sentence or two you have on a page and you need to be starting to talk about it. And then you're looking at the next sentence so that you can bridge well in your next paragraph and come mm -hmm. into it. And so that's the thing, the practice that helps you get it. Well, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because multitasking is so, um, <laughs> so elusive. There's so many people think <laughs> that they can do it and they really can. No, and, continual partial attention. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Especially with like in, in school and, um, and taking notes. Like it's so hard because I'm trying. I was trying to take notes from the professors, and I'm I'm writing this stuff down. I know that I'm not grasping it because I'm trying to do both of these things at the same time. Yeah, so. that's a a thing. Sometimes this is the thing I have people do in professional development that I think is really persuasive. I will put a slide up which has a bunch of academic jargon on it, and I'll say, okay, you know, uh, write down some key ideas from this slide. I'll be talking about them and take notes as your student would, and then we'll talk about something else for five minutes, and then I say. Uh, reproduce what was on the slide you can use anything in your notes or anything that i said hmm. and they almost always can't produce anything i said yeah not even close yeah. no but they all think that they're explaining about the stuff that's on their slide and students are learning it and they aren't no yeah <laughs> yeah well it's, and i've thought about it sometimes like in, in in my classes i would be sitting there and i'm like should i just especially it was it was tough because um it if the professor was um, going to post the content, I, it was tough for me to th decide whether I wanted to try and take notes and listen, mm -hmm. or just sit there and listen. Because then I don't, I, I would, I felt like I wouldn't look engaged, or like right. I wasn't doing anything if I was just sitting there staring at them. 
Because they'd be like, why isn't this kid taking notes? Right. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> yep. and, but I knew it would be posted later. And it's that and look like I don't care or sit there and look like I care and right. not grasp anything <laughs> and then have to try and relearn it before the exam. Like it's this weird yeah. puzzle. So. Yeah, the, the most effective note-taking strategy we're now learning is for you to be listening and summarizing. That mm. that's the most effective thing. And then when you go back and watch it later, if you do, looking for essential details or summary you might have missed. Yeah. But we don't teach students that. We just have them sit there and try to get to our main yeah. ideas. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of students never learn how to... Um, yeah, you said you never teach them that. And if they do, if a lot of students are taught to take notes or do this or that thing, they're not even taught how to do that well enough either. Like I was really yeah. never told or taught how to take notes i was told to jot things down yeah. and just like you said find the key ideas but oftentimes i ended up just trying to write verbatim what i was hearing because i found it was actually easier than trying to pick out things and write them down and listen it was easier to just try and transcribe and yeah miss but when you're transcribing you're not actually understanding yeah it's not much better it's no. just i felt like i just do it quickly but it's still just as poorly accurate well, and the function of taking notes is to reorganize learning so it stores itself in your brain. Mm. But we don't tell people that. Mm. <laughs> and, and so that it can be retrieved later. And so if we don't spend time having our students reorganize, and lots of times it's not clear to faculty what is more or less important. And so they test tiny minutia, thinking that that will distinguish between students who understood really well and students who did not. And yeah. there's no evidence that, in fact, that's what happens at all. Ability to remember tiny minutia is not really associated with disciplinary excellence. <laughs> it, it, that can be really frustrating on an exam as yeah. well from a, from a student's perspective. I remember there was a couple of times where, especially in stats, which I sucked at, so it was really frustrating. <laughs> Just, I'd be in a stats class and on the exam, we would have a question that was difficult but doable. And But then you get on the exam and they change the the format of it slightly or something here or it has to be done in a completely different way yeah i'm like i know i should understand how to do this but i don't know this weird tangent from the way you actually taught me right it's like i still grasp the concept of this statistic or this formula but i just i don't know how to do it this way and so lots of that's because they didn't teach you to understand the concept well enough that you could recognize it in every different permutation. Really, they yeah. told you one way to do it. You might have practiced it a couple of times. And then they're like, look at all the permutations. You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> look, yeah. we did not do that. Another example of testing what you didn't teach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's just, for me, that's, that's the best way to learn is to understand the, the theory of it, the background, why you're doing it. Like, um, when, it's really interesting because one of my girlfriend helps me out or asks me for help with school sometimes. Um, I'll be explaining something to her and she'll ask me to stop and just tell her, not necessarily the answer, but just show her how to do this question. Yeah. And it's hard for me because that doesn't help me. Right. I don't like. I don't need to know how to do this question. I need to know why this question is like this. You know, yeah. I'll be able to figure it out. I need to, but I need to understand the structure. Why is it this way? Why is it being asked? What are we trying to get? Whereas she just. When she's studying, she just wants me to show her how to do that particular question. So she can replicate that process yes. when asking yeah. the exam. You're like, wait, you need this concept. Yeah. You won't know. Yeah. And then it doesn't it doesn't help that on top of it for me, I need I need all of that information. Then I'm also not a very good teacher. So then I just can't explain it well to begin with. So she's like, stop, just just tell yeah. me how to do this. But, but yeah, it's really interesting because especially in math, like I found when I had a teacher that was like would um just explain things in a way that you could get it without like you knew what you were going to do before you saw the formulas yeah that was that was amazing that was so groundbreaking yeah and that helps so much yeah there's a bunch of research that says that that way of teaching mathematics is really important and that students who can do that kind of mathematical reasoning much more successful mm -hmm. in later mathematics when you teach that way but it's easier to say, I do this process. Now you do the process. Now you do evens and odds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was a, there's a really great Ted talk called, um, I think it's called uh, math is the language of the universe or math is the only language. Have you seen this video? Yes. You got to talk about like ap apples and, yep. um, for multiplication. Yeah. yeah. I watched it the other day and that was, um, I think I watched it last Sunday actually. And, um, it was amazing. Cause, um, thankfully that was the way. I was taught 
specifically multiplication was like it's instead of just three times seven what what is the answer it was yeah you weren't memorizing facts you're being taught whole to part actually. yeah exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. and so <laughs> i had i had a few good teachers that really put me on good paths that way that helps so much with mathematics yeah so but um it's interesting too because a lot of the times like you said um teachers are just trying to transfer information and so I find, unfortunately, it's just easier to do that sometimes. Be like, it is. this is the answer. This is how we got it. If you need help with the other questions, come help. Come see me and I'll, I'll show you how to do those <laughs> ones too. Instead of like, no, this is the theory. This is why we're doing it. Yeah. And yeah. so that same amount of time that you're spending doing even in odds in math, if a small group of students is standing at a series of whiteboards around the classroom and talking through the logic of math mm -hmm. and doing practice questions, just a few of them, and then you say, this is this question done wrong. This is the most common error that you're likely to make. Talk to your group about what's wrong about it. Mm -hmm. That combination that I just described to you, so much more effective than our classic math instruction. Really important change to make for the conceptual understanding of math, but also because our brains love errors, right? Mm -hmm. And so they'll look for that error, fix the error, and then make a generalization about how does it work with this new having fixed this error. So be great if we could help math teachers learn why they might want to do it that way. But often math teachers do the opposite of that because they were taught it in a way where they just duplicated process. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's, I'm, yeah. I love having these conversations with people like you because it makes me really excited to see that things are moving in a positive direction. We try. Yeah, Not so. always moving. We want them to, though. <laughs> it's still so exciting to see. Yeah. It's um specifically with math too in that that math is a language video or whatever it was called. I, I really like the idea too that not only showing like um what's actually happening in the math theory, but the, the actual language part and um verbalizing it in a way that it's um is not only applying to the numbers and symbols, you're actually putting other things in there. And um like having pictorial representations or yeah. having verbal representations. Yeah, it makes a big difference. Yeah, because it's just yeah. So it makes such sense if you understand how learning happens and you know that when you're using the verbal and and the pictorial that it's being attached in different places of your brain. I mean, it may, of course you would want to attach things in three different places. That's going to be so much stronger mm -hmm. than if you only attach in one place with a really thick rope. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like it just makes a lot of sense as soon as you start thinking about learning. But we don't think about learning sometimes when we design learning. Yeah. We think about easy have you um uh do you know about the youtube channel veritasium no i no? don't okay do you um now i feel like i've got to go look up veritasium he's he's fascinating do you know smarter every day yep. yeah yeah smarter <laughs> they're um veritasium is a little bit different i think he's an engineer as well okay. um but he had a video on um like learning styles and um about how those became very popular and, like i'm a visual learner yeah um I'm a, a hands-on learner. I'm an auditory learner. Yeah. What do you think about those? Well, styles? this is the, you're not going to like my answer here. Learning styles have been debunked. <laughs> That's why I asked. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so um, although I think it feels instinctively right to lots of people to say, I'm really helped by a picture because they are. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes we might confuse a preference a, th a thing that we prefer to have happen with a thing that makes my learning definably better. Mm. And so when we try to study that stuff, we look to say, well, if you say you learn this way and we teach you this way, is it true that you'll learn more and deeper? And the problem is we just don't have good evidence. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that, um, that's true. I'm going to write yeah. it down just so I remember to send it to you afterwards. But his video is actually on that. It's on that they're not necessarily yeah. true. And so I yeah. think you'd really like to. Yeah, interview. please do send it to me. I would really appreciate that. This has been a fun conversation, Ethan. Thank you. <laughs> it's been very fun for me as well. Veritasium uh, learning styles. He is very, very interesting. I think you'd like most of his videos. And he just does, um, it's just an education channel. He just yep. does on lots of different topics. Most of it is, uh, most of it is engineering and physics, but there's lots of other ones in there. I love good engineering stuff anyway. Yeah. I like how engineers break things down. It's so. Oh, yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. Really, that's why I love watching Smarter Every Day because yeah. just listening to him speak is, it's, uh, I just, I love that I can learn the things, you yeah. know, that 
There's another one. Um, do, have you ever watched any Vsauce videos? No, but many members of my family do. So <laughs> yeah. I'm always hearing about Vsauce. Yeah, Vsauce. Those ones are those ones are good because they're a little bit more um like they're a little bit more entertainment style. Yeah. So those are good too. Yeah. But, um. Yeah. Can you tell me more a, a little bit more about the Gwena Moss Center in particular? Sure. So what they're it's goals um. Are? It's a group of people whose job it is to work with programs on campus and with individual educators. So let's say you were redesigning the psychology curriculum or whatever it was, and mm. you're thinking, okay, well, what are we going to teach? What's the order we're going to teach it in? How are we going to teach it? We're the group of people who would bring some of the learning theory that we just talked about in math and say, you might want to do it this way instead of this way. And sometimes faculty want to work with us and sometimes they are good and they feel they don't need the help and they get to pick. So, mm -hmm. so they may or may not work with us. Um, but when they do, they kind of get to say, this is the thing we're thinking about. Do you have any advice on this thing? And then we would support that. Okay. We also just have general workshops so, or consultations. So you could be like, well, Wendy, I'm going to go teach this class on campus. Um, do you have any advice about the assessment? And I'd say, what are your questions, Nathan? And then we'd work on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, doc, Dr. Sean Ma was talking about, um, the, the trying to rework the first year engineering. Yeah. Program. So would yeah. they have come to you and yeah, up? we worked with them for a number of years actually. Oh, wow, yeah. And Sean's really interesting because he has such an engineering brain. And mm -hmm. so, uh, if he can be convinced that there's a more efficient way to do things, he's like, that's it. And now I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's a really good example of someone who asked himself some good questions and then just did something differently. And now he's like, this parts of it work, <clears throat> this part of it doesn't. And he will keep evolving that. But that kind of lifelong problem thinking brain for yeah. sure. Yeah. Engineers are so fascinating that way. Yeah, they are. There's no, there's no crap about it. They're, just, <laughs> they're like, this is, I'm solving this problem. Yep. Right. Yeah. 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 And so how long have you been, sorry, you're, are you the director of the Gwena Moss? I am. Okay. So there's a couple managers under me and then a <clears throat> series of educational developers. Mm. Yeah. And so I've been in that, in that kind of leadership role, not director. I was just a manager initially, but it, at the Gwena Moss for about five years. Yeah. Mm. You're enjoying it? I am. It's a really good place to work and good people there who feel like I do. Let me help you make your education better. Yeah. It's nice to work with a group of people that feel that way. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's an amazing goal to have, yeah. right? and especially when you can have like-minded people. It's one of those uh, areas I imagine that the people, the only people involved are the people that want to be there. It's not the type of place yeah. that you find people that are really... Not really, yeah. no. <laughs> You're not putting in time at the Glen mm -hmm. Center. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think it, it's pretty challenging in the sense that faculty are hired to teach because they're experts in their subject. They are not typically teachers. I mean, they might mm -hmm. be, but they're not hired for that. And so the amount of different questions that we receive and the breadth of questions that we receive is really big. So it's a job that helps you like learn new things all the time. Wow. Because when you're working with first year engineering, you don't understand the engineering. And, you know, Sean's talking to you about statistics and you're saying, so is this the most common conceptual problem students have or is it this one? Mm. <laughs> then he tries to explain some complicated calculus to you and you're like, no, <laughs> I don't have you there. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So you get to have really fun conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, so with professors, uh, I guess specifically in the University of Saskatchewan, maybe it's the same everywhere else, but do they... are, are a lot of them or some of them or most of them going to that position to become a professor or is it typically a position where they wanted to do research and they're being required to also teach courses like how do they yeah they yeah. they have to do a mix of uh research and teaching and committee work hmm. and they kind of you can juggle how much of each a bit but really that's true there are faculty positions on campus where you teach more courses and your research is all about teaching so if you really want to teach, you could do that kind of mm. position. But most people are doing a bunch of things, some of which they want to do. <laughs> that know? was Yeah, that was the yeah. next question. So yeah. do you get a lot of the more research-focused professors yeah. that you're trying to help out that are kind of like, I don't really, really want to be teaching? Yeah, them. and when the tenure and promotion process happens, um, not having done any publication means you really can't be promoted. But teaching in a way that is okay but not actually good does not prevent you from being promoted. So if you're smart, 
you make sure that your research is where it needs to be. You're not trying to be a bad teacher, but mm. you have to have that emphasis or you, you won't successfully move up. Mm. Yeah. Do they, um, do you get sought out? Does the Gwena Moss Center get sought out a lot? Or are you seeking out? We're entirely, you seek us out. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes there's a priority on campus that people are working on. So like indigenization or something like mm-hmm. that, where, um, there'll be a thing that everybody's trying to do. And then they, then we would say, well, if you're looking for stuff around this, here's what we could help you with that kind of thing. But usually people just are coming to us. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so when you are sought out and you, um, I guess what's the next steps? Like, is it, do you just go, do you have a plan that you follow with anybody that comes through and just, or is it completely different? (laughs) They come in, they say, here's the thing I'm thinking about. And then we try to help them from where they are. Sometimes there's a workshop series that they're participating in and that's really planned out. And then they just participate in that series of things. And then we might do follow up. Even when we're doing a big curriculum project, we're just attending meetings and helping structure the meetings. So it's like, all kinds of different things all the time mm. and that's another reason it's a wendy thing yeah <laughs> that's awesome yeah do you um do you find yourself to be with a debate background to be a little bit more disagreeable in, in <laughs> no. No? no i'm actually kind of conflict avoidant sometimes <laughs> yeah, fair enough. i like the i like the interplay of ideas i don't actually like conflict <laughs> yeah yeah that's fair enough because yeah. I, I imagine it'd be a, a hard balance sometimes to strike if you're very into and very good at debate as you are to um kind of i feel like it'd be hard sometimes to get into conversations and not be like i can completely dismantle this and just yeah you know. when, when i got married my husband and i were chatting about it at the time and he's like okay i'm really excited to get married but we we have to agree we're not fighting to win we're fighting <laughs> yeah. to resolve and i was like yep fair enough yeah that's good that's a good conversation yeah. <laughs> i think that's that's Outside of marriage and relationships, that's a, a huge issue, I think, for anybody teaching in any teaching and in any industry or whether it's in politics or in your household or anything is that people are fighting to win, I think, a lot. And um, increasingly, mm-hmm. yeah. When you look at science and research and academia, really, you should be trying to see the holes in your own arguments, right? You should be trying to see your own fallacies and where you can be better. But it seems like a lot of people right now are trying to find that only in other people and yeah. completely solidify their own position, regardless of mostly by attacking as opposed to, yeah. as you said, fully building. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Do you find that's something that you have to instill when you're uh, working with, with debaters? Yeah. Debate. Well, and in, and in, um, in, in this professional learning setting as well. I think that with professional learning, the key is for getting is to get people to actually understand that learning is constructed, because lots of times they're just thinking about what their students don't do well or how busy they are or a particular problem. They're not thinking about helping someone learn this thing well is a complex process, and I need to construct it intentionally. Mm-hmm. So just like an argument, it it has a series of parts that exist for a particular reason, and if you skip one or you don't think about one, you design a table that's going to fall. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, yeah. It'd be interesting. Cause I, I, I imagine an issue with that would be this idea that of, um, you need to, as an educator, create a rela- reality in a playing field that enables students to learn yep. instead of a top down approach where you're teaching because you need to obviously you need to teach to make somebody learn but i feel like i feel like the playing field is more important than it is and if you're thinking of yourself as a lecturer you're not particularly thinking about Mm -hmm. the learning you're only thinking about your own talking yeah yeah i've (laughs) i'm sure you've experienced this as well but i've had i've I've sat in lecture halls where it is just lecture yes that's all it is and it's it's not interesting no no um on the debate side of that, I feel like it would be um, more contrasted, actually. I feel like you would be trying to argue to win, or am I incorrect? You are arguing yeah. to win, but um, having a really well-constructed thought is so important because it's so easy to go after any little hole. 
And so right. you really have to spend a ton of time building your own well, or you will just lose automatically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Different provinces in Canada are good at different things. Saskatchewan is really good at the picking apart other people's arguments. It's a, just provincially, it's a thing we're good yeah. at. And so I spend maybe even more time on it because I know my students will typically come in with good skills in that area. Yeah. Yeah. That's got to be really fun too when you know that there's a niche that you can, you're just ready to specify in. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, I, f- I feel like I want to go watch a debate now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Let me check my time too. Sure. Oh yeah. He's here. <laughs> okay. Are you okay to wrap it? Yeah, no, this is perfect. Okay. We've uh we've done an hour and a half, so we've yeah. spoken for a while now. <laughs> All right. Well, um I guess just to close up, could you just say where anybody can find your work or if they want to get in touch with you about Yeah, the Guanamas Center has contact information for me. So if anybody's looking to find that, we're just you're looking up the Guanamas Center at the University of Saskatchewan. I don't usually say like my email online because then bots pick it up, which I don't want. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> I've been trying to clean up my email for so long. Um, I think that was it. Um, would you be open to doing this again sometime in the future? Sure. That was a great conversation and I'd love to cover more topics again. <laughs> yeah, it was a pleasure. Perfect. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs>